Good morning, Living Grace family. Good morning. Good morning, Josie. Everybody is not awake, and that's okay. <laughs> We're going to wake up with some worship today. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Can I just ask that you guys stand to your feet? You guys join us in praising the Lord this morning. It doesn't matter who's watching you. It doesn't matter how you feel. Give it to God right now, and let's worship his name. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs> between us fight across you came and broke them down you broke them down there were chains around us by your grace we are no longer bound no longer bound you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking, all the dead are coming. I'm back to life. Hear the songs awaken, all creation singing. We're alive, cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light. You call my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive, and what a love we found, death can hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me, your love is greater. Your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me.
just thank you, Lord. We thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for just this moment we get to come and be with you, Lord. We thank you for allowing for us to be free and able to praise and glorify your name, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be free in worship for you, Lord. God, I just pray for the hearts, for the minds of your followers who are in this room, Lord, that, that you would just prepare them for the message to come, Lord. That you would just be here, Father, in this room. Lord, we are available, Lord. We are making ourselves open and able and willing for you, just like we always should, Father. Lord, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor this morning. In your precious and mighty name we pray, Lord. Amen. Good morning, Living Grace family. How's everybody? Everybody's good this morning? <laughs> so good to see y'all. This I don't get to the 8 o'clock much, but y'all look so beautiful. We just want to say welcome if you're here as a first-time guest, whether you're here or watching online. We just want to say welcome because we know you could have picked any house of worship. We're thankful that you're in this house of worship. Amen. And we want to connect with you. If you're here today in person, we have um, a table in the lobby, a welcome table. We would love for you to go out, fill out a connect card, and take a special gift that's been designed just for you. Now, if you're watching online, you can find that connect card uh, under connect on the app. And you know what's on my heart? What's on my heart is to just pray real quickly for the ones watching online. Will y'all agree with me? Father God, I thank you. I thank you for all your children watching online. And I pray this morning, Lord, that as they watch online, that you would connect them in a way supernaturally with uh, your spirit in, in their inward parts, that they would feel as if they were here connected to this family with us. So, Lord, we just speak your supernatural connection with them, Lord, and that you would bless them right where they're at. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, and if you're watching online, we love you. We care about you. Bless you and ladies that's right we had our um second koinia yesterday and it was amazing it was like a date night with daddy okay we had so much fun right ladies we had so much fun but if you didn't get to make it just remember we do have one coming up on october the 5th and so there'll be more information coming out about that, and we want you to join us, okay? Amen? Okay, so is anybody looking for a life group? Because I got great news for you. The Shelley's Life Group is starting up again on September the 5th at 6 p.m. It's a co-ed life group. It's an inductive Bible study, so if you want to, and it's on the book of Daniel. If you want to learn anything about the book of Daniel, this is the Bible study to be at. And also, if you're looking to connect with this family in a, in a mighty way and, and to grow in your faith, this is the Bible study to go to. So they have fun, food, um, fellowship, and lots of facts about Daniel, about his courageous life and his connection to the end times. So if you're looking for a place to connect with Living Grace, get to the Shelley's Inductive Bible Study starting at and, uh, September the 5th at 6 p.m. Amen? And you can sign up in the lobby or online. Right? Now... Has anybody ever come to the Bunko Family Fun Night? Yeah. Woo! 
That is the Women's Ministry Annual Fundraiser. And it is coming September the 21st. So mark your calendars because we need your fellowship and we need your money for the building fund. Amen. So come on out. We, we have food and it is so much fun. So again, who's in here that's come before? Woo, I need to hear some response on that note now. It is so much fun. Next week, we're going to have some pictures just to, to demonstrate it for you. But remember, September the 21st, right here in this sanctuary at 5 p.m. Amen? Okay, so now, is everybody registered to vote? Amen. If you're here and you find yourself not registered, guess what? I got good news. There's registration forms in the lobby, and there will be nobody asking you, uh, who do you affiliate with? Who are you going to vote for? That's a personal thing. All we ask is that you would make sure you can vote, you would seek the Lord, and you would go vote. Amen? Amen. So, um, with that being said, I ask you one more time if you would just silence your cell phones. Because guess what we know? We know it ain't God calling because he's going to be speaking the message. Amen? So silence those cell phones. And everybody, turn your attention to the screens because we have a special invitation from a very special pastor. Amen? Hey, Living Grace Foursquare Church family, I want to invite you to something that I think is absolutely remarkable. It's going to be Saturday, August the 24th at 1.45 p.m. at the AMC Rainbow Promenade Theaters on Rainbow and Smoke Ranch. What is it? It is the movie called The Forge. We got a chance to see this movie and it's the latest from the Kendrick Brothers and it is an incredibly well done movie. Uh, it's got all sorts of great themes and twist plots that you might expect. Uh, it is about discipleship and it is about uh, pouring your life out in the, in the lives of other people. And so we're really excited about it. This is, I think, the first time that we've done something like this. And so we encourage you, put it on the calendar, get your tickets online or look at our website or our app. You'll see the link, AMC Rainbow Promenade. Rainbow and Smoke Ranch, Saturday, August the 24th at 1.45 p.m. to see The Forge. Let's watch it together. You'll be blessed. Amen. I, we just checked this morning. The link is not on the app. It must have fallen off, so I'll fix that as soon as service is over. So if you're looking right now to find the tickets, it's not there. But, but we'll, get it, we'll get that fixed. Um, just wanted to reiterate one thing that uh, Paulette was talking about. The, the, we have this map that's up here. This is actually our map of where all of our life groups are meeting at. And so if you're looking for a life group, find one that's in your neighborhood or whatever, and the sign-up sheet is right there. Um, the second thing I wanted to uh, talk to you guys about, it is Mission Sunday. We had an incredible missions week last week. We are going to go ahead and give everybody the opportunity to give, but I did tell you I wanted to uh, speak to you a little bit about, you know, we we just came back from overseas on mission, but we had mission last week just down the street, uh, handing out backpacks, and we had some amazing God conversations with people that were are, are, are needing our help, and they're needing uh, a lot of different things. And so mission is not necessarily just around the world. It is right here in our own backyard. Our, our, I don't know where our guys went that were going to collect the offering. Would you see if you can find them, Dale? Um, but, oh, they're there. They're there. They're hiding in the corner behind the pole. Um, but anyway, so uh, it is Mission Sunday to give you an opportunity to give. We're not going to go into a lot of other details. We may have a few people that were at that outreach last week at Second Service. Uh, we had some crazy, Pastor Richie literally had a two-hour conversation with a, a couple of these folks. Third thing that I wanted to uh, share with you guys is uh, I've had all kinds of questions already that have come up. Where's Pastor Richie? Um, he is going to be gone for five weeks. There is nothing weird going on. It's, it's, I've had people ask, is he okay? Is he sick? Yeah, he is completely fine. He is on sabbatical right now for the next five weeks. It is something that uh, we as pastors are supposed to do. Um, I told him how proud I am of him because he's the only pastor 
in 30 years of ministry that I have ever served with that has actually gone on sabbatical. And so he is going to be gone for the next five weeks to refresh and, and press into the presence of the Lord. But there is nothing weird going on. It, we, we sent him, our, our church council and the pastoral staff sent him for some time of renewal just to make sure that he is, is good because we want him around for a long time, right? Uh, we, we do. We want him around for a very long time. So in that stead, we have some amazing uh, people that are going to be speaking, and Pastor Dennis is going to be uh, bringing the message today. So Pastor Dennis, come on up. I'm going to pray with him. He's uh, going to be speaking the next three weeks, uh, finishing up the series that I think Pastor Richie started in January, I think. I don't know exactly when he started, but it's been a long time, and so we're going to finish that up. So if you guys stretch out your hand, let's pray for this man as he uh, brings the word. God, I thank you for Pastor Dennis. God, I thank you for his life. I thank you for the example that he is, and God, I thank you for using him today as a vessel to, to speak this word, God, that you've laid on his heart and to finish up this series that we've been talking about for so long. And so, God, use him today. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear uh, what he has to share with us this morning. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This is on. You can all hear me? Oh, very good. All right. I, I am a school teacher, so I do speak very loudly, too, if I have to. And not because I'm trying to be rude. I, I just want to make sure at the back they can hear me. Um, Yes, I am going to close out the last three books of the book of Revelation, or the, I'm sorry, three chapters of the book of Revelation. And uh, as Pastor Richard has asked me to do, uh, he asked me a couple of weeks ago if I would be uh, willing to do this. And uh, I thank him uh, for the uh, uh, honor. And uh, I humbly come before you to present uh, probably the book of the Bible, uh, the only book of the Bible that has not been completed. It has not happened. Sort of like spiritual sci-fi. We, we have not done it. It's, it. it's to come. And in that coming, it is written by somebody who I really want to talk a little bit about today before we start, is the Apostle John. Now, who was John by themselves? We hear so much about all of them, but John was a very young person when he started. He might have been 15, 16 years old when he became a disciple. A lot of people, I'm not sure, even know that. He not only does he become a disciple, but before he is a disciple of Christ, he is, talk about getting involved, he is a disciple of John the Baptist. And in that, he has to make that transition because John was somebody they really enjoyed. They enjoyed his mentorship. They enjoyed everything he was doing. I don't know if they enjoyed his wardrobe, but they did enjoy everything else about John. But John said, you got to go follow this other one. That's all there's to it. And that might have been a little difficult to do. I mean, if somebody was to say, you got to go follow this one and stop what you're doing right here, could be a difficult moment to deal with. But John, nevertheless, he goes. And in this, John is very unique in one aspect that I also want you to realize is that when Christ is crucified, John is the only one at the cross. All the others have run for their lives. Do not judge them. Do not get mad at them we probably would have been right there with them. But John, for some reason, is right there, and only God will know why, why he is there. Uh, and, and we know this very clearly because as Christ is hanging on the cross, he looks at John and says, John, your mother, mother, your son. And, and they, he makes this connection of responsibility between Mary and John at this point. Now, after 70 AD, the entire uh, nation of Israel has been dispersed due to uh, all the, the problems. The Roman Empire is finally fed up with everything and goes in and attacks. And all, all the Jews, except for those in hiding, will run for their lives. And John, like everybody else, has left, and wherever he's gone or anything. But at some point now, later on, he finds himself, for whatever reason, if he's either exiled or imprisoned or on vacation, he finds himself on the Isle of Patmos. Patmos now, as an island, a very unique moment in itself, uh, is uh, somewhat, uh, I would say, a little southwest of Turkey. It's in there. It's in the middle. If you were to look in the Mediterranean Sea, it is really a spot in the middle of nowhere. And there he is. I mean, you're just not going to swim off this. There it is. He's, he's there. And I have heard all my life that uh, he was exiled there because you had to work in the salt mines of Patmos, which I don't understand why you were working in the salt mines. The entire Mediterranean Sea has plenty of salt. 
to glean from if you have to get it, but for some reason that is what uh, I have heard from historians, something to this effect. And it is in this spot that Jesus Christ comes to him and says, John, I need you to write this book. Now, I want you to know most writers I know and most people get to go somewhere. They get to go sit down. They get to, they get to go on sabbatical, apparently. They get to go wherever they want to do it. But John now, he gets to do this. I want you to know, I, as a teacher, I, I teach writing. And in teaching of writing, those students have plenty of paper. They have plenty of pencils. Every single one of them has their own Chromebook. By the way, those Chromebooks that those kids have, that little toy that you think they have, is a million times more powerful than the computer that sent the men to the moon in 1969. That little toy that you see there, it's much more, in fact, your cell phones are more powerful than that. So when we talk about these devices, they, they have everything at their thing. John, I have no idea what he had there. Parchment, I have no idea what he's using for a pen. I have no idea what's going on. All I know is John now is about to write this book. John, in, at this point, is between 90 and 95 AD. I don't know if he's in his 80s, or I don't really know. I've tried to do the math on it a few times, but we don't really know. If he started when he was 15, 16 years old, he might be in his 80s at this point. We have no idea when he passes away or whatever. We just know of all the disciples or the apostles, he's pretty much it. That's it. And unlike the other three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which we call synoptic Gospels because the harmonization of those three Gospels are so parallel together, John's Gospel focuses on a very unique thing that all five books that John will write, which is the gospel for second and third John and Revelation, deal with light and darkness. Light and darkness. As the gospel of John said, in him was life and the life was the light to men and the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness could not comprehend it. If you ever wonder why the people you're talking to are not saved, don't understand you. It's not because they're not smart. And it doesn't, I don't mean this to be rude. Before you come to Christ, you are in darkness. You can write that down. It's, it's a note. You are in deep darkness at this point. I, I remember one time, and I'm not trying to be boastful of this, I emailed Stephen Hawking. I thought, I wonder if I could just email him and see if he talked to me. I'm thinking, he's not even going to answer. There's nobody even going to pay attention. Stephen Hawking. I could have counted to 10, and the email came back. I'm sorry, Professor Hawking is very busy, as I'm sure you understand, and is not ready to do this. I'm sorry to hear that, Stephen, because apparently you could find everything in your darkness, including the black hole, but could not find Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So it doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how, what college degrees you have. It doesn't matter what training you've taken. I mean, that was evident in the fact of who Jesus picked to lead the gospel. It doesn't matter what you have. If you do not have the Holy Spirit in your life, you are in darkness. And here we have John now coming to this point. And here, as we see it, just so you've heard that in the gospel, even in John 1, 5, it talks about light and darkness. In John 2 and 3, uh, actually John 2, verses 7 and 8, you see the comparison between those that are of light and those that are of darkness. The word is not used, but the implication is there. In John 3, you also see this moment uh, where it says, if these people do not accept you as the gospel, please avoid them at all costs. And what he's saying is that it's not we can't go into the world and we can't deal with it. We all go into the world all day long. We go into the grocery stores. We go into Walmart. We go into every possible. We go into our jobs. And let us not be under any illusion. There is darkness all around you. Are you the light? Are you the ones that, that they can see? And by the way, it's not your fault they don't see it. Has God called them? Has God uh, actually shedding his grace on them and, and those things as well? So now we have this moment of this book written by that apostle on this aisle in all these circumstances, and John, as a very old man, is now prepared to deal with it. Now, Pastor Richie has brought us through 19 chapters. In all these 19 chapters, we have seen numerous things that have taken place. I want you to realize throughout my entire life, listening to people talk about Revelation, they're tremendously afraid, nervous. When is this going to happen? Are we going to be here for this? Are we going to be here for that? I, I want you to realize there's only two chapters in the entire book where he actually is admonishing the believers. Revelation 2 and 3. 
the seven churches. There's your concern right there. Are you living on the fence? Are you hot or cold? Are you needing this? Are you looking this way? Are you, have you forgotten your first love? All the little things that we hear there. That's our concern. The rest of it, he's just telling us what's going to happen. And by the way, I want you to know before you even ever read this book again, always know this one thing, no matter what you think is going on there, Jesus Christ is pushing the buttons all the time. He is the only one pushing the buttons. He opens the six seal, seven seals. He helps them blast the seven trumpets. He is the one with the seven bowls of wrath. It is his power making them do these things. It is not like them, we just want to really give everybody a hard time. We want to control them with the mark. We want to do this. It is Jesus controlling everything every second of the moment. And so where is our fear? Where it tells us in Matthew uh, chapter 6, be anxious for nothing. Do not be afraid. As he tells us at the end of Matthew 28, I am with you until the end of the age. Uh, This is part of the end of the age, by the way. Now, for all of those in the room that may say, I don't know when we're going to get raptured. Do not ask me either. Do not do it. Because I want you to realize in 2 Peter 3, 3 through 9, Jesus Christ, or I'm sorry, the Apostle Paul is about to say something. I'm sorry. Let's go to this clearly. Help me with this. Peter is about to say something. That's why we call it Second Peter. Second Peter is about to say something. It says, and just to paraphrase it shortly, to God, a thousand years is a day, and a day is a thousand years. I, I do not comprehend that type of time more there. You know, I, I don't get that one. But I do know that that's what he tells us thousand years. And we're going to come back to that moment by the end of this today about this thousand year thing. I sat under John Michael at one point over at Calvary Chapel. I happened to be there one Sunday evening and he spoke on this moment here. And he says the reason for this is that absolutely time does not matter to God under any circumstances. And for the most part, yes, that is true. It, it, not in the way you understand time does it matter to God. But God does have time because it tells us in Acts chapter 1 Right off the bat, when, when he says, it is not for you to know days or times as the Lord, but has set by his own authority. Therefore, he has fixed a day when all those things will happen. In John, or Acts 17, he says, and know this there, that uh, in, in the end, God has fixed a day in which he will justly judge the world, and by this through a man who is raised from the dead. So we know that time is fixed, but God has fixed it. It's a scripted moment with God. You, still in your days, we plan, we think, we'll do this about 2 o'clock, there and there. God doesn't have those types of times the way you have time. God is never late. God is also never early. Because God knows what time he's going to be, and God can be everywhere all at the same time whenever he feels like it. So the idea of time, when you're thinking, when is this going to happen, when is this going to happen, when God feels like it. If I don't even know if God has feelings in the way I understand feelings. It's just God does what he does. And that brings us here now to these last three chapters. Chapter 20 of Revelation, if you now would open your Bible. How ironic that I would say chapter 20 since I'm going to read the last two verses of chapter 19, but you can open that up if you'd like. And it says this right off the bat. Chapter 19, verse 20, which is very close to chapter 20. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came in the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. I mean, there's a lot of animals eating these dead people here. Before I go any further with that, did you all hear that? Did, I, I'm looking for the impact in the room here. I, you'll see in a moment here. I really am big on impact. I even tell my students, I want impact. <laughs> impact. <laughs> impact is when it really finally hits you what's going on. When they go, oh my gosh, I just got it. I tell them a lot of times, and I'll tell all of you too, that many times you hear things, whether it's in a classroom or this, and many years down the road you're just shopping or doing something, you go, oh my gosh, I just got what they were talking about. It's just that, that's just us. That's just being human. But at this point here, the beast was seized. 
did you just hear that? Yeah, uh, see, the beast was seized and the false prophet. And they were thrown basically into the lake of fire. Okay, I'm going to leave that for a moment. Chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. I still don't see the impact. Okay, let me, let me help you with this one. In 2003, every newspaper, every television stopped what they were doing. Everybody went, we have a special report. Saddam Hussein has been captured. Everyone, whoa, cheers. Yo, the city of Iraq, throwing his statues down, everything. In 2006, he was, he was executed by hanging. Ah, cheers, cheers, cheers. Oh, wow, it's all done. In 2011... Osama bin Laden has been captured and neutralized just as fast as he was captured. I'll explain neutralized it later. There they are. Cheers, newspapers, everything except it. We talked about it for weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, Satan has been captured. The one that we all every day go, the enemy, the enemy, the enemy. He has been caught. And by the way, God sent out a very powerful army. An angel. Nameless, too. We don't even have Michael. We don't even have Gabriel. We have an angel. I don't even know who this angel is. I want you to know whoever he is. I hope he's never coming after me. An angel. A whole angel. And he's going to come now. And this is what he does. He's holding in his hand a key and a very big chain. No tanks, no nuclear weapons. No other, just a key and a chain. And he comes over, and as fast as he comes, he laid hold of the dragon, who is also called the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. I, I'd say that's a pretty long time, according, according to God back in <laughs> Second Peter 3, uh, for a day. Did you get a thousand years as a day, a day as a thousand years, uh, for a day? Okay, got that one? And, and therefore he threw him in and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive nations any longer. I want you to know, even though he's going to come back in a little bit, Satan's deceptive career ended right here. It's all over. Oh, by the way, you don't have to be deceived by Satan. Satan, by the way, and I want to say this not boastfully, I want to say it with humility because I'm not minimizing his power. Satan, if you truly are a child of Jesus Christ and you have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, and those that have will say amen, he can do nothing to you. You can do plenty to you. He can throw all the temptations in front of you, everything, because he knows your weakness is up and down. He can lay them out day in and day out. You decide if you're going to fall for it. But he cannot make you do anything. So at this point, he has been captured. He cannot even go out deceiving any longer. He can't do any of this. And yet, until the thousand years is over. And there we go, that thousand years. There it comes up again, a thousand years I, I'm, I'm 72. I haven't made it to 100 yet. I'm almost 73, but it's still not 100. That means I would only have 927 more years to go on that vacation plan. I don't know what any of you would look at it with that way, you know. And see, you see, like, oh, wow, he's 72 years old, and the 18-year-old in the room, I'm only 18, which means you will be 982 years old at that point. It doesn't really matter when we're that far close to 1,000 anymore. But the thing of it is, is we know that he's locked up now. It's all there. And by the way, not only him, we know that he's with the, the false prophet. We know he's with the Antichrist. We know he's with all the people who didn't make it because we're about to find that out. So now we're in verse 4 of chapter 20. And then it said, I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. These are people who are saved. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. 
and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's us, by the way. Oh, for those that have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. If you haven't accepted Christ, I am not, not mean this judgmentally, right after service, we'll go right over there. You may have as much of Christ as you want. You can give up all your sins. Dale Kincaid has told me many times, when you come to the Lord, you can give up all your sins. You don't like it, and six months later, you can have them all back. There is nothing to it, okay? It's all yours, okay? You can have as much holiness as you want. The thing of it is, that's the moment. And what he's giving us right here is that we get to be for a thousand years. What do we do for a thousand years? Do we ever wonder what, what's going to happen for a thousand years? What, 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 what really is going to take place for a thousand years? I mean, we, we better go, oh, I got two weeks vacation coming up. No, you have a thousand years. I personally have thought about it numerous times. I'm going to catch up on my sleep. <laughs> I don't, I, you, you don't know when you have problems sleeping like I do, you want to catch up on your sleep. Okay. I, I, I said, by the way, I, if I say to Dale, because we've been friends for a long time, uh, uh, Dale can sleep very well. I, I don't sleep very well. Dale says, that's because you're doing it wrong. <laughs> He's probably right. You know. The thing of it is, is, is in all, all this moment here, for a thousand years, what would you do? How would you do it? Where would you go with it? What would take place? Zechariah tells us, chapter 8, verse 1. And it's a small part, because I, I'm not going to make you go there. I'm just going to say in Zechariah, chapter 8, what happens there is that Zechariah is going to talk about this endless moment of time that's going on. This, this thousand years seems like an endless moment, but he's talking about it. And he says, the elderly people, they're just going to sit around with their canes and all that. And the children are going to play in the streets. Now, I'm going, okay. You know, I don't know if I say that to these children today. You're going to play in the streets. I don't like to go in the streets. You know, I want to go to my game. I, I don't know what, what we're doing here. The thing of it is, is you have to think about it, how Zechariah is writing it from the time he's writing it and the circumstances. Whatever your retirement moment is, you get to do it for a 1,000 years endlessly. You want to go out to breakfast. You want to go out to lunch. I don't know if there's food going on. Whatever you want to do. You want a vacation here for, oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to do that for nine years. That will only give me now 991 years to go of doing something else. I don't know. Is there any work? He doesn't talk about work. He doesn't talk, it's just endless 1,000 years. And what was the title of this teaching today? 1,000 years of peace. Peace to do whatever you feel like. Of course, according within the realm of what God is. Because he doesn't really tell us. All he does is give us hints of things throughout scripture. Isaiah 65 tells us. <laughs> this is a cute one. It says, In that period of time, if somebody was to die at 110 years old, we would go, oh, and they died in their youth. <laughs> the thousand years. They barely had any life. It's sort of like... Somebody comes in life and they go, oh, they're 21. They, they died so young in life and they really didn't get to experience anything. Of course, in, in Isaiah, it says, he says, they died at 110 years old. They barely got to do anything. That's how the perspective of this thousand years is going on. And we have this moment of this place. I, I, I realize one church talks about, you know, when, when we leave here, uh, you go to purgatory. I don't know where that is, but I know when I leave here, I get the thousand years. And not only do I get the thousand years, guess who else gets, it, it talks about who else came to us. People were raised from the beheaded ones, those who had been tortured, those who had done this, everybody who had not received the mark, which means when does the mark come? I th thought we're all raptured. Doesn't the mark come after that? See, I, those are the little moments here. Does anybody have the real assurance of when it takes place or why it's taking place? I want to tell you my theory about the mark anyway. It, they, they talk about the mark like it's a, a, uh, one of those code, those things you stamp in the store when you run it by the scanner. And I thought, how are you going to get somebody to put that on their arm or head? How are you going to talk to somebody? Yeah, that looks attractive. We live in an age of tattoo hysteria. It's sort of like that credit card. I got a credit card, one would say, of the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Don't ever talk about that team to me live. But the Dallas Cowboys, and there it is, and there's their credit card. Or they have one with the picture of their child, or they have their pet on it. And there it is, they can scan that. 
Now you can scan through your tattoo, whatever you want there, uh, and all the, there's the mark. But anybody in this room, I'm really begging you. I don't care if your baby's crying to the highest level. I don't care how hungry anybody gets. I don't care how serious it is, how painful it hurts. Do not take this. Do not even be deceived into it. Because the ones who get here, as it says here, do not have the mark on their forehead or on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. We just don't come. We get to reign. I'm not sure what that really means yet. I haven't got the job description down. How, how do I reign with Christ? I mean, we're talking about somebody who made the sun, made the world in seven days and all this. We're going to talk about that seven-day thing in a minute too. All this is taking place. All this is happening. All these wonderful moments are, 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 are tingling within in us. And yet, I, 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 what does that mean? Do I get to order people about or do I get to do something or reign or do I rule? Or I mean, everybody's pretty much on an even level. You know, if somebody's doing whatever they want, well, what do they care who's in charge? I got freedom. I got plenty of money. I got plenty of this. I got plenty of whatever. It, he's making this sound like it is totally the best thing next to heaven. It's a thousand years, though. Now, I have no idea how impatient anybody in the room is, but I'm going to assume if it's a thousand years, it will take a while. However, John uniquely does something here. I don't know if he's uniquely doing it. He's just trying to do what Jesus is trying to say. As he says here now, in verse 5 of chapter 20, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. You are all part of the first resurrection. You see, there's no impact on that. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what, you know. You just won $35 billion. Okay, you right now are part of the first resurrection. That's worth, that price tag is much more expensive than the $35 billion. See, there's the, the impact, and you know what? Because in the reality of our human life, because we're, as Ephesians says, we're constantly at battle with ourselves. The real enemy is you. When you look in the mirror, there is my problem every day. That's the one that might tempt me. That's the one that might do it. See, this is the one you're looking at. And it, what, it, what it goes here is that the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. That means they don't get to be part of this. So there's just peace and safety and everything you want to talk about. This is the first resurrection. We are part of the first, first resurrection and Satan is still in jail. Verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power but they will be priests of God and Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. I'm not sure what that means. What do you mean I'm going to reign? I'm going to be a priest. I'm going to be this. I don't even know if I need titles. I, I, all I know is what it's telling me here. And I dearly hold to that. It's a surprise. He's, he's going to surprise us at the end. But then notice here what John does. After he's got us here, we're just in the beginning of the book. Verse 7. Look what happens in verse 7. Now, when the thousand years were completed, Satan will be released from prison and will come to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. The reason I kept reading there is that's the whole sentence. I don't know what there is about me. I, I don't know if it's obsessive compulsive disorder. I love to read the whole sentence. I really hate to stop in the middle of a sentence. However, I'm not here to tell John or God or anything as a writing teacher, that's a run-on sentence. I just need you to understand it right off the bat. But that's all right. Who am I to tell God how to write his word? Okay, And yet, all the things that are going on there. When the thousand years are completed, do you realize we just barely got into the thousand years and the thousand years are completed that fast? That's how long, that, that's the whole thing that, that's taking place in this moment. It's that fast. Satan will be released from prison. Now, that seems to be alarming. That, that there is, might be an impact. Oh, no, here we go again with the deceiver guy. And will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, which as, as Gog and Magog are, are, are like an army of rebels during the millennium type of thing. And a number of them is like the sand of the seashore, which means if you ever just go to the beach and you've seen the sand and you see uh, the endless moments of it, nobody's counting it, that's how many people are in this army. Remember, Satan was taken down by an angel. Satan now has the army. Okay, And in this, uh, 
came down from, uh, I'm sorry, and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, which is probably Jerusalem, and the saints. And there, there, there we all are. Whoever we are in that thousand years, we have now been surrounded by this endless uh, number of sands on the beach and Satan himself and his army, and they're surrounded. And no sooner are they surrounded, no sooner than it happens, and it says here, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Oh, there's, I thought he was there. He's gone now. I don't know what happened. You know, I see a lot of fire, but I don't see Satan anymore. You know, it's all gone. The thing being, as, as you're, you're looking at all of that, it's, everything's like this. Now, throughout my entire life as a Christian, they said, Satan knows the word really well. He knows everything about this word. He knows intensely what this word is about. He sees this word everywhere. He, he knows how to use it. He knows how to misuse it. He knows how to manipulate. He knows how to just, he knows it all. Well, if he knows it all, why does he waste his time to do this knowing that he's going to be in a nanosecond burnt up with fire? And by the way, let me help you with this last part here. Not let me, let the word help you with this. Verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, before I go anywhere else with this, you watch a movie or you read a book and you see the rising actions going up to the climax and the evil ones or whoever they are and you wonder how this is going to happen by the end of the story. Oh, relief. The the protagonist has been devoured and destroyed and everything and happily ever after. As of chapter 20, verse 10, Satan is gone forever. There is no more Satan in our lives. He is not coming back. There is no anything he can do. There is no way that he, he's got, well, magically he will be. You know, I see this in so many movies. And the bad guy comes back. And the bad guy comes back. This bad guy doesn't come back. It's gone. And by the way, Satan knows this. Yet in his pride, his, I'm not going to analyze what his personality is like and anything. He does this. Whatever, we just know forever and forever he's now in the lake of fire with the Antichrist, with all the false people, with all those that did not ex accept Christ as Lord and Savior. None of them make it. So now here we are, the last part of chapter 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them for the people who fled away and I saw the dead the great and the small standing before the throne and books were opened books plural were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. When you accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, your deeds vanished. Past, present, and future. The blood of Jesus Christ has covered you since then. Please do not mock that and do all the awful things that come with that. And, and before I even one time condemn you, I say that to myself a thousand times fold. We are all vulnerable as human beings to the temptations of existence. We are all vulnerable to the problems that are out there. But we are also very blessed in the fact that we have so much of Christ that we can go to for uh, shelter and protection and his word to constantly bring us through this. And by the way, Paul, I, I want you to know I, I'm not really that big of an Alabama fan, but I can see why they win so much because they have a secret weapon, the prayer warrior, Paul. <laughs> the, point, <laughs> the point of it is, <laughs> the point of it is, is that within us, you have no idea the power of your prayer life, the power of, of you going to, to what Christ is, the power of going to his word and all of that. But to these people who didn't do it, they are not going to make it. And this isn't to be crying about it or sad or anything as we're going to find out in the last two chapters. But in this moment here, as it simply says, and I saw the dead, the great and the small. By the way, 
it doesn't matter how we look at them in life, how much money they have, how much they're celebrated, how many talents they have, how many abilities they have, how many things they can do. I want you to know my whole perspective recently has been changed in so many ways in sports. And I don't want to talk about sports per se, but I want to talk about it. I'm making a point about it in the sense of my perspective. Oh, do I love it when they make their three-pointers? Do I love my teams when they win? Do I love this? But recently, I happened to be introduced to two women. Don't take that wrong. Two women. One died in 2003, and one is still very much alive. And both of them are considered right now by those who understand what they've done the greatest athletes in history. I had no idea that these people even existed. Years had passed before I even knew what they did. I mean, I think it's wonderful that how he threw the football, and I think it's wonderful how he throws the basketball, and I think it's wonderful how they play on the court. And I watched the Olympics and all the wonderful things they did. The one person swam the English Channel. I think that beats the three-point shot. Because the enemy out there are 16-foot waves, salt water eating at your life, and swam from France to England in 14 hours. Ladies, you're going to love this one. Beating the men's record by two hours. Babe Ruth bowed before this woman. As one person said tonight, after she made it across the English Channel, tonight, the greatest athlete in the world is not Babe Ruth. It is not Jack Dempsey. It is truly elderly who now has completed this, this moment. And the thing of it is, is not so much what they've done, is that the completion of how my perspective has changed about what actions the world takes, because God Almighty has done much more than all of them combined, and he did it. I, 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 that was too slow. I, faster than that. God Almighty has done all these things. And so the book opened. Now, get ready. Here we go. The books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and judged the things that were written in the books according to their deeds. Now, the sea gave up the dead, which were in it. See, everybody's coming back. And death and Hades gave up the dead, which were in it. And they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. Every one according to their deeds. Not the saved, the people who did not accept Christ. According to their deeds. I, I want you to know, I praise God dearly. Uh, I can't imagine how long it would take God to go through all my deeds for 72 years. And every one of them, as Chuck Smith had said one time, I would be saying, ouch, at the end of them. Ooh, ah, ooh don't, oh, you, you remember that one? Oh, that was horrible. Okay, don't, oh, yeah, oh my gosh. When I talked back to my mom, oh gosh, how ugly that was. Okay, yeah. My dad took care of that too. But don't let that, the thing of it is, is all the deeds, how many deeds? Think about all your deeds and think to yourself, oh, thank God that I am saved and he's not going to bring those up with me. But he's going to bring it up with all these people. And then death and Hades, get ready, after he does all this, were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Remember the first death, the first resurrection? That's us. We don't have any part of the second death because we are saved. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Do you have friends? Do you have families? Do you have people you're concerned with? Don't hound them. Don't harass them. Be a light in front of them. Let them see the light. That light will shine much faster than all the words coming out of your mouth. They might get up in the morning and see you reading your Bible. They might see you going to church when they're all going off to somewhere else. They might see you at a Bible study they might see you with that t-shirt that you just adorn, adorn all the time. Whatever those things are that they see, because in that, if, if they don't make it, they are thrown into the lake of fire. Now, Pastor Ferris, his thing, we took a missions fund today, I'm assuming because we're going to do missions. And though on missions is not necessarily always an evangelical moment, it's not, it's not there, you know, we're building, we're helping everything, but the idea is that they're seeing the light in us while they're doing it. And as a result of it, many people come to the Lord. In fact, some countries that Pastor Ferris has gone into, he said, you just don't talk about these things. You don't openly talk about that. You are, they will give you a problem. But can they see the light? 
So here we have the chapter 20 at this moment here. What we saw here is at the beginning, Satan was thrown into prison for a thousand years. We saw that we're on vacation for a thousand years. I have no idea what is going to happen, but I'm still not getting the impact of any of you, like a thousand year vacation. No bills, no anything. What do I do for money? I have no idea, but he's made this out to sound like it's a pretty pleasurable moment. I don't think that's going to be an issue. Gosh, I don't know. Can I shop online? I have no idea. I have no idea what's going to happen in those thousand years, except that we are going to be in a thousand years, and absolutely, this is a, a thousand years of peace, a reign of this moment. It's almost like a day of rest. If a thousand years, this is a day. Now, I want you to know that I'm not big into this. I like reading the word of God for, from beginning to end. I don't like to go out and play with it and go here and talk all kinds of anecdotes. I like to stay with the word of God. By the way, am I in my spot here? I, I, oh, thank you. Okay. He, he got me all marked here. I was so worried that I was going to. Anyway, I want to go through this thousand years and go right back to what it said in Second Peter 3. And a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. I want you to realize that as a school teacher, and I read a social studies book, and it says 17,000 years ago, <laughs> nonsense, <laughs> no way. 18,000 years ago, no. 25 million years ago, I have no idea. God would know, but you weren't around to even know about it. From Adam to this moment is max 6,000 years. From Adam to this moment. Now, when I say Adam, I'm going to really kind of go from the fall because Adam to the fall was supposed to live forever. So I have no idea how long Adam and Eve really had forever going on until, of course, the, the mistake was made. And then from that point, you shall surely die. And I have no idea what they meant by surely die because he doesn't die for 900 years, give or take. But the thing of it is, from Adam to this point is approximately 6,000 years. So when somebody tells you, well, 12,000 years ago, well, 8,000 years ago, or 11,000 years ago, or people from foreign planets came down and helped them build the pyramids 17,000 years ago, I'm not asking you to laugh in their face. I want you to realize they are in darkness because the light has enlightened me to know, and I've done the calculations from Adam to this point is 6,000 years. That doesn't seem all that long, does it? But let's just see what little theory I have, because I'm with John Michael on a thousand years means God really doesn't care about time whatsoever, or does it really mean anything. But I want us to look at one moment here, that in the beginning, God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. And a lot of people said, well, those were millenniums in between. I don't know. It says he did this, then there was morning and evening the first day. When I understand morning and evening, I'm talking a 24-hour period. I don't know what they're talking about. So in seven day, six days, he creates the world, and seven day, they, they, they're all uh, having a day of rest, or he's resting. God's resting. I can't imagine that God needs rest, but God's resting. But here, from Adam, and I'll say from the fall, to the birth of Abram, who is going to become Abraham, or the beginning of the Jewish nation, is 2,000 years. That would be how many days? Two, thank you. I, I, I was hoping I was talking about it. From Abraham to David is 1,000 years. How many, how many days is that? So two and one is? From David to Christ is 1,000 years. That would be another day. And so now we have three plus one is? We're in the year 2024. From Christ to now is approximately 2,000 years or six days. And the millennial kingdom is 1,000 years. We rest on that day. Now, that's speculation. I have no way of knowing if that's true or not, but I do like playing with that one. But I do know this, and every timetable I look at from beginning to end, and any Bible I look at or any scholar I look at, from Adam to this moment. 
Now, in the Jewish calendar, we know that the, it is the year 5784. Well, that means that would be 216 years short of the 6,000. But I don't know how close to 6,000 Christ is really talking about at this point. He's going to let us know because just as I said at the beginning of Acts, no man knows the day or the hour. He's just going to come at the time he's fixed and he's going to take whoever he's going to take and, and they're going to go to heaven and the rest are not going to be in the thousand year millennium. All this is going on in this one chapter. So for 19 chapters, we've heard about all these horrific things. Oh, the seven seals and the damage and the war and the conquering that goes on. We hear about the, the trumpets and all the things that take place. It's that last trumpet that appears in, in chapter 11 that kind of always throws me off uh, because there are seven trumpets. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, it says, you shall not all die, but you shall be raised up in a moment and twinkling in an eye at the last trumpet. Now, I know it's going to be at a trumpet, but why tell me it's going to be a last one? Because if you have a last trumpet, what do you have to have? I have to have at least a first trumpet. So which, how many trumpets are we talking about here? So am I going to be raptured in chapter 11? Am I going to be raptured back in chapter 4? Where am I going to be? It doesn't really matter because you're going to be protected through this whole thing. Your only worry was back in chapters 2 and 3, am I sitting on the fence? Have I forgotten my first love? Am I doing this? There's the admonishment. The, right now the point is you are in the absolute protective grasp of Jesus Christ and Satan has nothing over you. In all of this, and by the way, don't go home and lose sleep over that 7,000 year thing I rambled on about. Just so funny, I could see God doing patterns like that. I, I don't know, it just seems like something he would do. The thing of it is, is as we go through this, is to remember, I don't need to be anxious for anything. I don't need to worry about anything. He's got this all under control, no matter how ugly this looks. Do not let our human side cause us to perish over it. And with that, if the worship person could come up here, let's pray. Heavenly Father, first and foremost, thank you for your word, which through diligent study and reflection and meditation can truly open up a new world for us. It can help us in so many different ways to do so many different things, to look at things like we've never looked at it before. Father, we are reading a book and I will be the first to tell you, I have no idea all the little things and how you're going to do them. I just follow the steps that I see that it's going on here. And I pray, Father, that you give the confidence and the boldness and, and, and the relaxation to each person in this room to realize no matter what it says here, we are spared from this. And the worst thing that can happen is we leave this world, but for a thousand years, we get to reign with Christ as a priest. And then after that, well, we'll find that out next week. But in all this, we do give praise and thanks. Father, we pray for Pastor Richard while he's away, asking for him to be rested and ready and renewed when he comes back. We pray for our building, Father, as uh, funds are being constantly raised. And as, as Paula said about that one thing, raising money through that, that uh, activity. And, and all those, Father, you are in charge of all those things. Let us, Father, find that peace to know that we have nothing to worry about because you have now been, are, and always will be in charge. And we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As to the worship team plays over in that spot right there by the altar, uh, leaders of the church will go over there and pray for anybody who needs prayer for anything today.
we just pray blessings upon you, church. We love you all so much. And God, we just thank you for this moment again, for allowing for us to just be here and worship and praise your name. We pray for our weeks. We pray that we would walk in and with you this week, Lord, that we would just find you and that you would find us where we're at, just like you always do. In your precious and mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.